Hi, this is Chuck Martin of the AS Summit in New York. I'm happy to say we have with me here Anna Birge Auberge. So tell me, uh, Vice President of R&D and IT at AstraZeneca, you just came off the program. Tell me what you talked about. So we talked about scaling AI, in particular generative AI, and what kind of things you need to think about to make it successful. So scaling AI in, in organizations that are so large today, how does that go? I mean, that's going to be a big task. It is a big task, but uh, we broke it down into certain components, uh, really like honing in and really prioritizing what you want to go after, rather than go after everything that is possible. And uh, really broke it down into different steps you need to do in order to get it successful. So as, as background, where does AI fit in medicine today? Uh, is, it, is it just drug discovery? Is it, is it, is it something else? What, what, you know, what are the areas? Because like, there's got to be a lot. Yeah, so uh, I think it can solve many problems, but for us, uh, we hone in on the research side and the development side of the medicines. That's why we do a lot of both predictive AI and generative AI, and it helps us uh, with the pipeline and how we do the research. So healthcare is highly regulated, obviously, for obvious reasons. How does that fit in terms of an organization moving, I mean, not just yours, but any organization moving forward that's extremely regulated? So you need to be very careful how you go about it. Uh, so for example, when we do AI in development, which is highly uh, regulated, we need to make sure that the platforms are fit for the purpose and actually guardrails so it stays uh, validated through the courts. When we do generative AI, we always need to keep a human in the loop to make sure that they can check the content, check the outcome before we take it anywhere further. But I do, I do generally think that is a good practice, regulated and not regulated, uh, not just trust blindly, but understand what the capabilities are and where you need to keep the human in the loop. So in the medicine industry, if you will, is that just part of the DNA already? So I would say that, I would say most uh, biopharma industry that develop medicines use AI since many, many years back because it's very a large data sets we're looking into. It's by nature that you dive in and you read a lot of articles, you look at previous experiments. It's just more than the human brain can take in in months and months and months of research. So AI have helped uh, the medicine development many, many years and I think all biopharma uh, industries are, have been going into AI in the last five, 10 years. So in a large organization these days with this technology, does AI always have to scale or can there be little, be little pockets around the, the world that aren't scalable? Yeah, it's, it's, it's room for both. So I, I think that um, there are many, many small experiments that can be done. They spun it up, they spin up an example, an experiment, and you have to have a platform to allow uh, the scientists to test their ideas and use AI at their fingertips. And those doesn't really scale and they don't need to scale. It's a one-off experiment and they're testing their ideas and seeing how valid it is. But then there are certain things that are, have to be repeated a thousand times maybe every day. And those are quite good to package up, make it very easy to use. And those are the ones you really want to scale so they don't need to rebuild it every day. So you've been doing this for a while, so you've seen a lot of the trends in, in AI. Is it getting faster, slower, or the same in terms of deployment? I think in general, everyone sees that the speed is just going up. Um, so what we have done is we have completely changed how we do projects. Uh, like five years ago, we planned the project, we enrolled the project team, we executed. Today, we have stand up a team that work with a backlog. So we can very, very quickly release new uh, innovations and it's more testing along the way. So we spin up a small, we test it, and if it works, then we scale it. So at, at a higher level, how do you support the AI teams? Because you've always got a lot of teams. How do you support that? Or how does an organization support that? So by having persistent teams and not spinning up new project teams, it really helps us uh, to build the knowledge and uh, add on the capabilities that we didn't have before. So we have trained people into new areas. We hired people as well with the new capabilities, but we also retrain people with previous capabilities. So software developers today also can merge over and do AI solutions. And AI solutions are very often very dependent on software engineers. 
So it's, I would say we cross train more and more. Equally, we cross train the business and, uh, and the scientists so they also can spin up experiments uh, uh, from, from scratch and, and really use the AI at their fingertips. So with generative AI, chat, GBT, I mean, all these new things that you're aware yeah. of, have you seen business goals and AI initiatives be more aligned or less aligned or the same as a few years ago? I would say um, it's more important than ever because things are moving so fast so it's easy to get lost in the woods. Uh, I think it's even more important because you can spend so much money on implementing and if you don't do the right things, you're never going to get the payback. So I think it's more important than ever to start with the business goals, thinking what you really need to um, prioritize and go after. So for us, we have a bold ambition uh, to get 20 new medicines to market, reach an $80 billion company, and be a sustainable um, net carbon zero. Those are big uh, objectives. It's very big <laughs> objectives. And everything we do with Scale AI really lead to help to reach those goals. And when it does, it, you will get the payback on the investment. If you just go after everything that is possible, you may or may not get the payback. So, so does the company have to have a, prove a small win uh, and then go step at a time? Yes, so we had a uh, our first big generative AI solutions. We built a multi-agent uh, research assistant that really can democratize the knowledge in research. And we built it up as a very small proof of concept. And then we had a sit down, we just had, it was just a pilot stage and we sat down with a young generation of scientists. And I thought they're going to raise scientific questions, but there was a lady who asked me, Anna, why don't all here, all the scientists have access to this amazing tool? It really reduced from weeks for me to do uh, the target uh, discovery and, and doing the, the literature search that I need to do first, to minutes. Why don't you make this available to everyone? And that was our first big pilot in generative AI. And then we took it back to the most senior uh, managers and they say you have to scale it immediately. We had planned to scale it many, many months later, but we had quickly to pivot and scale it to all employees. And um, that was a big win because it really helped people on a day-to-day -day basis and really democratize the knowledge between different departments, uh, different areas, different roles and helps everyone to have the information about science at their fingertips. So pe people, in terms of employees, do they have to learn that? So that because th there's this obvious fear of AI replacing, which it obviously doesn't. Um, yeah. Do they have to learn that it's actually a new tool for them? It is a, it is a new tool and uh, people can opt in or not. Um, just the research assistant, it really picked up and spread by word of mouth because it was so easy. It felt like Google, but it only answered scientific questions and it gave credible, cited answers so they could check the answers. Of course, we need to train people of not blindly trust the answers, but go and do the fact checks, follow the sources, and they need to own the answer. They can't delegate that to AI. Uh, and there's some level of training. So we've rolled out a quite big uh, program where we have uh, offline training. Uh, we do um, uh, bigger workshops. Uh, we have some uh, fairs where we bring it to life and people can come and touch it. So we have a comprehensive program together with HR, of course, to train people on it. Some people just pick it up and start using it. Some need a little bit of training and uh, it depends. <laughs> it, it really depends. Uh, but I, I would say when people realize that they can work more efficient and have more at their hand, more information at their hand, they see the value and they want to use it. So a year from now, we're sitting here talking about AI. What would we be talking about? I think uh, that we will have a backlash. It's, people have an unrealistic belief in what AI can do. Uh, and I think that it generally in the society, it will be a bit backlash. Uh, so I think we're going to sit and talk about the backlash that less people are believing in it and the importance of continue to move forward because you learn so much in each iteration. And it's so important not to stop because it will bring value. It is bringing value, but it's not bringing as much value as some people want to believe. They think they can do everything and they can trust the AI completely. Uh, but I think we're going to talk about how we handle the backlash in society and uh, how important it is to keep trying and keep learning and building slowly out. 
I look forward to that conversation. Thank you so much. This is Chuck Martin, the AI Summit New York.